The DBQ, that dreaded essay that makes your heart beat fast and your armpit sweat is now upon you and you want to figure out how to get a perfect score on it. Well, that's what this video is for. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Now, everything I'm about to say in this video applies to the document-based question for all the AP histories, world, US, and Europe. They're all scored on the same rubric and thus require all the same skills. So I'm going to break down everything you need to earn every one of the points in this essay. And if your armpits are already sweaty, then pause this, go have a proper cry, and then let's move on to step one. So step one, read the prompt carefully. Carefully. Now, trust me here, you cannot afford to skip this step because if you don't end up writing an essay that the prompt is asking you to write, then no points for you. And this is even more important because the AP overlords who write these prompts don't seem to be concerned to write them in the clearest possible language. So as you consider the prompt that they give you, you need to do three things and you should always, 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 1000 times always mark up the prompt. So the first thing you need to do is mark what time period they're asking you to write about. If they ask you to write about immigration in the second half of the 19th century and you write about immigration in the first half of the 19th century, you burn. And I would always advise you to write the actual numbers if they give you centuries. If they want you to write about the 16th century, write out 1500s. I know that sounds elementary, but remember, when you are under pressure, you are dumber than you think. I'm not trying to insult you, it's just a law of the universe, so make sure you get those dates correct. Okay, the second thing you need to do is mark the category or categories in which they want you to write. For example, the 2022 AP Euro DBQ was this, evaluate whether the English Civil War was motivated primarily by religious reasons or primarily by political reasons. In that prompt, you need to underline religious and political. Those are the categories that are going to define your essay. And in this case, one of them is going to be more important than the other. Like if you start talking all about economic reasons for the English Civil War, you're not going to get any points. And then the third thing you need to do is either notice or decide which historical thinking skill is going to frame your essay. I say notice or decide because sometimes they'll tell you what that skill is and sometimes they won't and you have to decide which thinking skill is most appropriate for your essay. So in that Euro prompt we just considered, the historical thinking skill is explicitly stated. Which of these reasons caused the English Civil War. So your essay needs to demonstrate causation. But in this prompt from the 2022 APUSH exam, the historical thinking skill isn't explicitly stated. So you could write a causation essay here, or you could write a continuity and change over time essay, or whatever, it's like writer's choice. Okay, now real quick, before we get to step two, let me quickly mention two resources that are gonna help you write your DBQ. First is a DBQ planning sheet, which is free and linked below. The second is my APSA cram course, which has videos from this guy that you won't find here on YouTube. In this course, I explain in detail every skill and every rubric point for the DBQ, LEQ, and SAQ. So if that sounds like something that might help you, then get your clicky finger out and do your worst. All right, step two, read the documents quickly. Now you're gonna have seven documents after your prompt. No more, no less. And the suggested reading period for those documents is 15 minutes. And I think that's about right for what you need to do with them. And let me tell you what that is. First, read the documents one at a time quickly. And by quickly, I mean, you know, like maybe a minute each. And I can already hear the great weeping and gnashing of teeth rising up at this point. Like some of the documents are hard to understand and I need to spend more time on them. Listen, you you do you, boo, but over the course of the school year, you need to get enough practice with interpreting documents that you can read and understand them relatively quickly. Now hear me, hear me. The first place you need to start reading is not the first sentence of the document. You need to start here at this citation. It's going to tell you who wrote it or who produced it. It's going to tell you the year it was written or produced, and it might offer some critical information that you might not otherwise know. Second thing you need to do is summarize the main idea of the document in your own words off to the side. Don't quote it, summarize it. Now this is going to feel hard, and that's because it is hard. Your synapses are gonna be firing like crazy, but summarizing these documents is gonna help you in writing about them. So just write down the main idea and move on. Third, group your documents. Now to be clear, grouping is not required on the rubric, but it's often the difference between a high scoring and a low scoring essay. So as you're reading through the documents and summarizing them right next to it, what kind of document it is. If it's a document about economics, write economics. If religion, write religion. If social, write social and so on. Like these are going to be your grouping categories. And the rule of thumb is like two to three categories since that's about all you can do with seven documents. But that's not a hard rule, just a suggestion. And then once you have your categories set up and you have your documents organized under them, you now have the beginnings of a thesis and the structure of your essay. Now the one thing you do not want to do with your documents is to write an essay that basically goes like this. In document one it says, in document two it says, in document three it says, etc. It is almost impossible to get a high score that way and it's usually a signal to the reader that the person who wrote this essay doesn't know how to handle evidence. So grouping your documents will save you from that error. All right, and step three, get that Seven. So now that it's time to start writing, let me go through the rubric point by point so you know exactly what you need to do in order to earn all seven points. And I'll just talk in generalities here, but if you want more specifics, I got a lot of videos that you can reference. So the first point on the rubric is for the thesis, and you can earn up to one point here. Now, arguably, the thesis is one of the most important things you are going to write in your essay because it frames your entire argument. Your thesis should be your entire argument in miniature. The rubric says that you can earn this point by writing a historically defensible claim that establishes a line of reasoning. So what in the fresh heck does 
does that mean? Well, first, it must be historically defensible. That means you have to take a position here. Like, was the English Civil War primarily caused by religion or primarily caused by politics? Did imperialism affect economies to a great extent or not much at all? Like, which is it? Did the United States develop a national identity between 1800 and 1850 or not really? Whatever it is, your thesis needs to take a clear position. Now, also what this means is that your thesis needs to be factually correct. Like, if your thesis says that the Emancipation Proclamation caused European imperial expansion, eh, no, that's like not true in any universe, discovered or undiscovered. Now, second, the thesis has to establish a line of reasoning. That means you need to demonstrate how you're going to prove the argument that you're making, and you do that by dropping vocabulary into your thesis, and here's what I mean. The United States developed a national identity to a great extent from 1800 to 1855. Now, that's a claim, and it is historically defensible, like it takes a position, but it does not establish a line of reasoning. This thesis would not earn the point, but watch what happens when we take that argument and establish a line of reasoning. Despite the exclusion of minorities from the American national identity, the majority of the United States developed a national identity to a great extent as a result of the nationalizing forces after the War of 1812 and the expansion of democracy during the Age of Jackson. Now, notice three things I've done here. First, I acknowledge a counter-argument. There are documents in this DBQ about Cherokee Indians and women and black Americans that demonstrate their marginalization. Second, I use the language of the prompt to frame my argument. Now, that's important because it ensures that you're writing about what you're supposed to be writing about. And third, I established a line of reasoning by using specific historical evidence. I I wasn't vague, I named these pieces of evidence. Though I'm not even sure that's the argument I would make on that essay, the thesis would earn the point. So pack that thesis tighter than a Scottish haggis and, you know, you'll be golden. And if you want a formula for a thesis, I'll give you one. Restate the important parts of the prompt because A and B. So use the language of the prompt to frame your argument and then A and B will be your specific historical evidence. It's basic, but it checks all the boxes for the thesis point. Okay, now the second point is for contextualization. You can earn up to one point here. Now contextualization is there to situate your argument in the larger historical context. And the rubric tells you that you can explain the historical context before, during, or after the time period of the prompt. But by far the most intuitive way to earn this point is by explaining events that occurred before your given time period. So in order to earn this point, your contextualization should be about three to four content-rich sentences that describe historical events related to your prompt. So you've got a claim in your thesis arguing about the effects of European expansion in Africa and Asian economies in the 19th and 20th century. Your contextualization needs to go backwards in time and explain how we got there. So it needs to explore either the second wave of European imperialism and how that came about, or African and Asian economies before the time period, or ideally both. You can't just talk about events that happened before the time period, you have to talk about related events that occurred before the time period. And you have to be specific. Again, drop vocabulary words into this. Talk about the Spanish colonial empire and the Americas and the cash crop system, be specific. Okay, now quick tip, how far should you go back for your contextualization? Well, the discipline of contextualization itself really demands that you're looking at the immediate context. And so the general rule rule of thumb for A-Push and AP-Euro is about 50 to 100 years back, and closer to 50 than 100. And for AP-World, you might be able to go 100 to 200 years back, and again, those are just general guidelines, and it really depends on the prompt. My best advice, though, is to keep your contextualization as close to your time period as you can. Okay, and now we get to the evidence section. As I mentioned, you're going to have seven documents to work with, and I'm going to give you the point breakdown first and then show you how to earn them. And in this section, you can get up to three points. One point is awarded for successfully describing the contents of three documents in relation to the prompt. And two points are awarded for support supporting your argument with at least four documents. Okay, so that's two points for the evidence section, and you can earn the remaining one point by writing about evidence related to your prompt, which is not mentioned in the documents, and this is called evidence beyond the documents. And if you do that successfully, that's one point. Okay, now that was a lot, let me just explain a little, and let's start with your handling of the documents. Now, I hope you noticed there that there were two different ways of handling the documents. You can describe them, or you can support an argument with them. And describing gets you one point, and supporting gets you two. So, what's the difference? Well, describing a document is exactly what it sounds like. You say, document, one says, and then you accurately summarize that document. If you do that three times, one point. But you're not here for one point, you're here for full points. So let's see how to use at least four documents to support an argument. Now the first step here is to describe the document. Document one says, and then accurately summarize the document in your own words. And I know there are teachers out there rolling their eyes at me like, documents don't say things, people say things. Don't start your sentence with document one says. Hey, I know, and I agree with you, but for simplicity and clarity, I'm just gonna explain it like this. So summarize the document and then begin the next sentence with, this shows, or or this demonstrates, and then write about how that document proves your thesis. You've always got to be tying your evidence back to your thesis, and this is the best way that I know how to do it. So to me, the key to getting this point comes down to two things. First is the grouping of the documents, which I already talked about. Second is topic sentences. So suppose I grouped documents one, three, and five as economic documents. So in order to use these in support of an argument, I'd start by writing a topic sentence for the paragraph that explained why economics was the cause of such and such. And then within the paragraph, I'd use my documents to demonstrate why that topic sentence is true. Okay, 
Okay, now the next part of the evidence section is one point for evidence beyond the documents. Now to earn this point, you need to connect a specific piece of evidence to the argument of your prompt. And also, it can't be something that's mentioned in the documents themselves. So this requires you to name it, explain what it is, and then connect it to your argument. So three things, name, explain, and connect. And people tend to lose this point because they usually can name a piece of evidence, but then they forget to explain it and connect it. And there's no specific place you need to do this, just stick it wherever it's relevant. And although it's not mentioned on the rubric, the general rule of thumb here is that your outside evidence needs to come from the same time period that is given in the prompt. And then the last section of the rubric is for analysis and reasoning. And for this section, you can earn up to two points. Now the first section is about sourcing documents, and you can earn up to one point for sourcing at least two documents. Now to be fair, this is one of the harder things for most students to do, so let me just try to explain it. To source a document means that you show how a document's historical situation, audience, purpose, or point of view is relevant to the interpretation of the document. The acronym here is HAPPY, and I'll tell you about the why in a moment. So to source for a historical situation means to place the document in its larger historical context. So if your document is Lincoln's second inaugural address, then it might be important to know its historical situation, which is to say the American Civil War. To source for audience, you need to demonstrate why it's important for us to know to whom this was written. A personal letter might say something much different about a person than a political stump speech, and the difference comes down to audience. To source for purpose, you need to explain what a document was intended to do. Not what it says, but what did it do. For example, if you have a nationalistic speech from a leader of a colonized nation, then you need to tell us what that speech actually was intended to accomplish. Did the people rise up and demand independence because of this, etc. So to source for point of view, you need to answer the question, why does he or she say what he or she says in the way that he or she says it? And the special sauce of point of view analysis comes from the end of that question, in the way that he or she says it. Now you only have to perform one of those sourcing skills for each document you try to source. So for example, if you're gonna source document two, you don't have to go through all four of those sourcing skills. You just choose one that makes the most sense for that document and that's it. So your sourcing sentence should say something like this. The historical situation of this document is X and that matters because, and that last part is the why of happy, like why does your sourcing analysis matter to the interpretation of the document and your overall argument? And if you don't do that for your sourcing, you're very unlikely to earn the point. So do that for two documents and you know, actually I'd recommend you do it for three in case you get one of them wrong and then you'll get the point. And then the final part of this section of the rubric is awarded for complexity and you can earn one point for this skill. And the rubric gives you like seven different ways to earn this point, but I'm only going to explain the two most straightforward methods. First, you can earn complexity by successfully using all seven documents to support your thesis. And it doesn't have to be fancy, it doesn't have to be elegant. If you do for all seven documents the same thing that you did for those four documents in the evidence section, then boom, you get the complexity point. Second, you can earn complexity by successfully sourcing four documents instead of two. Again, the skill is exactly the same, you just have to do it two more times. And if you do that, boom, complexity point. And then the last thing you need to remember about the complexity point is that it can be awarded for part of the essay. So if you choose any of the other ways to earn complexity, which in my opinion are harder than the two I explained, then you can demonstrate that skill in a well-crafted paragraph. The whole essay does not necessarily need to be complex. Okay, click here to see my other videos on the various skills needed for the DBQ, or you can click right here and grab my APSA cram course and I'll hold your hand through all the writing. Thanks for coming around and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.